Okay, hi everybody and welcome back to MyX Artist and Scholar Dialogue series where MyX staff and curators are speaking with different artists and scholars about their work, the impact the pandemic has had on their practice, and just what they've been up to in the past year or so. Um, my name is Lily McEnany and I am an assistant curator at the museum. And today we're going to be speaking with Deborah Hohola, who is a completely brilliant interdisciplinary artist and curator whose works move between paintings to frescoes to installation to ceramics. Um, so it's a lot to talk about today, um, but before we start talking with um, Deborah, I'd like to briefly acknowledge the place where this conversation is happening, even though we are in a virtual space in Ogopoge within the Tewa world. As a non-native person living in so-called Santa Fe, I am a guest in the ancestral homelands of the Tewa people. And I wish to acknowledge all the native folks past, present, and future who walk on these lands. So Deborah, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to have you um, to have this conversation with you today. Oh, uh, happy to be here. I am very honored to be a part of your series. And um, again, um, just thank you for this opportunity. Absolutely. Um, so for maybe the viewers who don't know you, why don't we start with a brief introduction, who you are, where you're from, what you do. Okay, I am a uh, an artist from the Pueblo of Isleta and Jemez. Uh, I am right now um, living in Isleta and I am giving honors to my ancestors also here in Dui. And I am always um, in respectful, hopefully will uh, speak um, you know, to you with much interest in the work that I do. I, I'm very versatile in my mediums. I definitely uh, love art and always had since I've been um, a, a young girl. Um, I always had a fascination with creativity and drawing and always had that skill and um, have just with my interest and my love and my passion have always just started to draw what I've seen, or I have a really great memory on design elements and stories, or just my childhood. Through this point, I am now as a mature um, mother and daughter and grandmother, and um, you know, artist still. You know, so I have. Um, traveled well in my life, you could say, and have been very blessed. Absolutely. Um, so you said that you've always kind of had this fascination with creativity and you have a great memory of design elements. And um, I'm just wondering where this came from. Can you tell us a, a bit about how you got to where you are today in your artistic well, journey? Yeah, sure. I think, uh, excuse me, I think a part of it well, I think most of it comes from, you know, our, our DNA as native people and uh, indigenous people to the, to the land. We have always been very uh, creative and clever and, um, and utilize what was around us, our surroundings, our resources and have, um, and, you know, I've seen traditional art still um, take place and, and looking at that work um, as a child and being told the stories and the purpose has been that inspiration and has been um, the curiosity that I have to research and learn and to continue telling a story through my art in, I guess, in my own way. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that curiosity is such an important point um, with, work, with your work and the collections work that you do too. Um, so you mentioned that you are versatile in several mediums. So can you kind of take us through the different um, aspects of your work and um, talk about your perspective on all those different mediums? Well, I started off drawing. Uh, my brother very, is a very good, talented artist himself. Of course, like others, he's got a family and 
didn't take that seriously. My parents were very artistic with their hands and utilized their hands in different ways. My dad built my mother's house. So he, you know, he was, I saw the way he observed and, and learn, and he was a self-taught, you know, mechanic, um, contractor. I mean, he did many things. He was even a veterinarian. I mean, you know, he learned to do things constantly to keep his family going and keep them prospered in, in life and living. I mean, both my parents were victims of the boarding school. So as I was growing up, um, my mother's from Hamas, she speaks Toa, and my dad's from here, which is a Tiwa language. So, you know, the hazards of the boarding school has raised our family speaking English. So struggling with language was always an issue as we grew up. And, uh, um, you know, still trying to learn it to these days and what we learned trying to pass that to my grandkids has been an ongoing um, goal of mine. And I, you know, my family from Hamas, um, or, uh, my, my grandmother did pottery, so did my aunts. I mean, now, you know, with time and changes in our lives, um, you know, that kind of slowed down, but I've always seen the art in their house, the traditional techniques that are used in not just everyday arts and crafts, but in traditional um, aspects of art and how it was used and how it was used throughout our environment. So that has always been the spark of my interest. And from there, you know, drawing, keeping that memory in mind and drawing those, um, starting to teach myself how to paint. My parents gave me, um, always was very interested in what I was gonna come up with next, you know, as they saw me drawing. So I was always supportive with, them giving me what extra money they could to go buy art supplies. And I taught myself how to oil paint. When I got into high school, I started doing more oil painting and jewelry making. I was doing cast silver and loved that aspect. I had a, my brother had a, a really good friend, Tony Hohola, who is a glass blower. So he was very real inspiring to me. He's also from the Pueblo of Isleta. And, and he told me about the Institute of American Indian Art when I was very young. And, and I thought, hey, I'm going to go there. So when I got there and seen the multimedias in their studio art courses, you know, I dabbed into everything to where I figured out that I was going to be a painter. And the following semester, I took printmaking and I go, no, I want to be a printmaker, you know, and, you know, all these different areas as you start to branch out and go to different, um, go to college and start to get the studio training um, has, all, you know, has opened many doors. And, you know, it's to me, it was like, I'm going to try that and I'm going to do my very best at what I try. So that I am always constantly making something that I appreciate, you know, and others will appreciate like my parents, I was always really wanting to show them that, you know, it wasn't a waste of time there, there were old school thinkers so, you know, art to them was like, you know, whatever it is you do, we support you. So it was kind of, um, um, that idea of art school, they didn't really know what that meant, you know? Mm -hmm. And as I started to come home, show projects and this is printmaking and I tell them what it was about. And this is jewelry, this is photography, this is painting. And, you know, they started to develop this appreciation in the many facets of art, just like I was, you know? So not just my, my, family but also my brothers and my sister I'm the youngest of 
of four older um, two brothers and a sister. So, you know, they were in off doing special interests of their own. So it was, uh, and then, you know, furthering my education, I was got into lithography at UNM um, and Native American studies and art and land and art ecology. And then just combining all those, you know, once you get into grad school, they challenge you with, you know, how can you take lithography and combine it with your clay work, you know, and, and thinking about that heavily and, and make, and building those two mediums and to introduce them and marry them to where they get, you know, they begin to have a relationship. So that's how I started to utilize my art and what I have learned with all these studio practices and how to engage them into each other to layer them into an art form that becomes my own and becomes my own type of story that I want to take, take to the public or take to the next level and, um, you know, and I always did tons of research. I, I love reading about, you know, the past of my ancestors, the different locations of ancestral sites, the technique of art back in those days. So that led to my frescoes, to going out and digging natural pigments, which were also part of my clay work. And, and building those two into a, um, a relationship of to storytelling. Yeah, thank you for sharing all of that. Um, that was really fantastic. Um, I think the way that you described it, your layered art form is mm -hmm. such a good way to kind of encompass all of it because you're really hard to describe and to kind of talk about all of the different things that you do because you do move between mediums and kind of blend them like you're saying. Um, so kind of building off of that, you just started talking about your frescoes a little bit. Could you kind of go a little bit more into that and tell us maybe for people who maybe haven't seen your frescoes before, um, tell us. Yeah, a little well, about. first of all, frescoes, um, you know, have been done throughout the world by different cultures. Uh, it's one of the oldest painting um, art forms that have been used throughout, um, throughout time. Um, in some of the Pueblos here, it's a dying art form. And, um, and you know, I felt that um, looking at, you know, the Sistine Chapel and the frescoes there, looking at frescoes when I was in Russia, looking at frescoes, you know, that interest of, again, that building that relationship that I was challenged with, um, lithography and clay work. How do I combine the two? And that question always was in back of my mind that sparked an interest with how, how was I gonna do that? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you draw on limestone in lithography, which is, comes from a quarry that's mined it from the earth. So it has that relationship already with the earth like pigments and the soil and so they all come from you know the earth which is you know the most important place for all of us you know without no water without no earth without no air we don't exist so also that important factor of you know those elements that we need every day so my frescoes were all built on that same concept of going back to the earth and using those resources. So what I do is um, my son and I have developed this technique. He's, he's getting really good at this. Uh, we go to a cultivated field that has been worked with, you know, rather it's implements or tractors, but the earth has been turned and mixed throughout so many years that the soil is perfect. The clay is mixed with the soil and we collect that dry dirt. And once I collect that dry dirt, we sift it to a very fine, fine 
grainier uh, texture. And um, then I mixed that with distilled water. Everything's distilled water because water is so contaminated nowadays. Um, and my frescoes, I do um, for them to be uh, movable. Sometimes if I'm lucky, I get to do them on the wall in museums, which is my favorite way to do them. But right now to, to in order to make some money, and like any artist, you know, we want to sell our work and share it with the world. So I do them on um, portable panels. I build these panels out of a board and um, frame them and I cover them with a burlap and, and then I plaster them. And it's a wet on wet process. So when my plaster is nice and damp, then I start, um, in, the, in the meantime, while I plaster, I'm laying it to get a little firm. I'm mixing my pigments. And once I mix my pigments and get a consistency that I like, then I paint wet on wet. I can't work with air conditioners on or heaters. I can't work with very strong overhead lighting. So I got to work in a very calm, cool environment because you don't want your plaster to dry because it defeats the purpose so you're constantly working quick my sketches are done I know have these ideas I mean color scheme is not a big thing I don't need a color sketches because for some reason I really got this good concept of color so I already know what things are going to look like in my mind and once the plaster is ready then I just go to town and at this point, your plaster is wet. You can add, I like to add willow. I like to add my, do texture with my fingers. I like to draw on it and, and do mark making um, while the plaster is wet and then start to apply my pigments. And uh, when the pigments and um, touch the surface of the plaster, they develop a relationship which I call they kiss and marry for life. And it, and they will never separate. I mean, that's something that is rare in our own human life. I mean, no one kiss and marry for life no more. I mean, there's so many shortcuts to make, to feel that we need to, you know, go a different direction. But that is what I really love to describe in my frescoes. And once that relationship is built and you can hear it and you can smell it, I mean, the surface of that is just like it just rained outside. So even the smells are, are just very stimulating. It's, it's a very, it's a quick process, but it's very um, gratifying. I mean, it opens all these senses of yours where you're hearing the sound of, the way you plaster, you're smelling the mud. And then once you finish that composition, you just drape it with a piece of plastic so it doesn't dry right away. Because with time, it's going to develop its own relationship. And rather you get a crackle effect on some you can, and others it's just completely smooth. And that's the process of a fresco. Long time ago, like in Europe and um, in other countries, they crushed marble, marble dust, you know, like where in Europe where they did all sculptures, they use that marble dust from all the sculptures that were being made. And that was their plaster. That's why it was so white and shiny. Mm -hmm. You know, here we use a little bit of a mica, you know, so the mica gives it this iridescent glittering effect. And I add that also in my pigments. So it just has this really unique, unique surface that I think to me, process is real important and is my drive. You know, it really like lithography. I mean, before you can even print one print, you got to etch that stone. You got to make sure your, your acids and your 
lithotene or does, you know, are in a mixture that's not going to burn it out or over etch it. So you become this type of scientist that, you know, you're mixing or you're blending or you're mixing colors and, you know, you don't want, you don't want nothing to go wrong. So you're, you're paying a lot of attention. And, you know, I always, tell my mother I call everybody beforehand I start to work because you know I don't want someone to call me in the middle of my work and you know well as as much as I can I usually talk to my mom and my son and you know uh, my boyfriend and tell him you know I'm gonna be working for seven to eight hours don't call me till you know I'll call you when I'm done so you know it takes a lot of time it takes a lot of patience um I like working with different shapes of my surface. I do a tapalita shape. I do um, rectangle shapes. I used to paint round. So shapes, you know, I like breaking the barrier of, of square and, um, and just like playing with texture. Texture to me is very inviting to want to achieve something that you've seen in nature. And nature has been that pathway to discovery and curiosity. So in a nutshell, that's frescoes. Yeah, wow, wow. Maybe this is naive, but I, it never occurred to me how quickly you would have to work doing those. But now that you're describing it, it makes perfect sense. It's yeah, fact- you can't uh, break for lunch and um, say, well, you know, I'll go buy me something and come back no it's pretty critical you're involved all that time so it always takes me back to my ancestors when they were in kivas or ceremonial houses and they were doing the great frescoes like at pottery mount and they were plastering you know huge walls and doing designs that were related to a purpose related to a ceremony or to you know whatever purpose it was you know there's not enough information out there but just by me doing them I really think it might have been women that did these and you know I'm not being biased in any way but just you know being um from Hamas and looking at them plastered houses outside you know in the spring, you know, getting ready for, you know, the summer of feast days or ceremonies, you know, we, I help my aunts plas, plas, plaster the outsides of the adobe homes. And that's when, you know, it sparked that interest, you know, wow, they did this so long ago. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it takes a family or the community effort, you know, nothing is just a solo person. So this is how I feel is that relationship to the past is just keeping this um, medium and, and, and reviving this technique. It's so important to me. I don't know how important it is to other people, but to me, I feel like it's really important that I continue this. Absolutely. I think it's really important. <laughs> um, yeah, I think um that point about you keep making this point about relationships whether it's between the kiss and marry for life kind of idea Mm -hmm. or your relationship with your ancestors and I think that's just so evident when you experience your work too um so that's really interesting to hear um and a little while ago you mentioned um sometimes you do frescoes right on museum walls so I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about your museum work and because your frescoes are often part of installation pieces, right? So I'd love to hear more about um, your installation work too. Okay, my latest installation piece was at um, the University of Texas Tech at um, the Landmark Gallery. And, um, oh no, I didn't do a fresco there, excuse me, but that was my last, installation um it was at the Moknug I'm sorry man I just forgot about that it was for the reconciliation exhibit which was um oh it was so fantastic uh to be able to 
have a wall. Well, I had two walls and to be able to um, invite people because it was a collaboration. There was, I think five of us artists, it ended up being five of us at the end that actually, um, I got to have a mix the, the mud and um, we all got our hands dirty by plastering the walls and, um, and, and just doing that. It was basically um, two frescoes in that storyline about, um, about the event that happens in Santa Fe de la, um, la Entrada. And that's what it was about. And my fresco was called uh, Prayers to All My Relatives because it has a very harsh history I mean, just like a lot of um, um, post-contact when, um, when it interrupted the lives of the Pueblo people. And, you know, I try to think of words that are um, important in describing this event because we like any race or indigenous tribe anywhere, you know, they have their struggles, but um, this was very harsh. And for them to re, re-celebrate such a bad event annually, they needed some change to happen. And I think that to me, my frescoes represented that that prayer to, you know, my, my relatives, I mean, not just present, but past and for the future. And a fresco is not gonna live a very long time. So, you know, rather you're a religious or spiritual person, you know, you're, you're used to praying and you want things to go well, despite whatever happens, nobody knows our, what's gonna happen tomorrow, you know? so. I felt that at that time, it was really needed for those that were brutally hung, the warriors that were hung in the plaza. And and that's what that story meant. It meant a, a bunch of bad things. And I'm glad that it was stopped. And, you know, my art, I'm not a real activist and need to go protest. Um, in the streets and yell and shout and and cause more harm. I feel that my installations do that in a silent, peaceful way. It brings an awareness of of our purpose in life. You know, we all want to live and better ourselves. We want to grow and mature as as people. And, and respect everything that is alive on this planet. And I feel that that's what my frescoes do. I feel that my frescoes give a voice um, of my ancestors in some ways and a, of my people now, you know, that are struggling to keep our language, keep our culture, to keep the waters clean, you know, to keep our sacred sites from being dug up or put a drilling rig on them or something, you know? I feel that that's what my art installations do. It's like a, it's like a, a voice that make you think how delicate life is and our planet is. And if we don't mention that somehow in some shape or form, you know, I like I always taught when I was teaching at the Institute of American Indian Art, you know, a mark on a paper that you make, that's Indian art. Don't have to be horses and Indians on horses carrying a bow and arrow. You know, I used to really lecture my classes. I mean, come from within. And I feel that's what my frescoes and my installations do. They, they speak also for themselves. You know, I do my willow woman that I weave from willow reeds that I pick on my walks. And she's like a cocoon. She's hollow, 
but she's this delicate woman that represents the earth and and what society is sucking out of her and not giving back no more she's losing her life she's the world is becoming this hollow hollow you know planet if we don't think twice so you know that to me is very mind-blowing if you look at it that way you know and you know the frescoes just add that other niche to that story yeah well again thank you for sharing that um I think that's a really profound um way to think about it and thinking about the medium of frescoes and installation work kind of mirrors what you're talking about right um so that's very cool very cool um I love that show at Mokna that was like oh, yeah. my favorite exhibits I think I've ever seen it was just I spent a lot of time in there. It was really, really Yeah, cool. I give great credit to the Mokna, not just as alumni, but they also um, allowed me to fresco previous to that with um, the show on um, Soul Sisters that talked about uh, re-imaging Kateri Kathawika. So that's where I did my first solo show there and did, I mean, not solo, but did my first, art installation there and did my frescoes on the wall mm -hmm. yeah so uh yeah I give them high accreditation for them going beyond the boundary of museums and allowing indigenous artists to speak their minds you know and 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 cross these boundaries I mean if we don't cross these boundaries then you know we're always going to be kept in this little box right. and I really enjoy that about what they do Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, shifting gears a little bit, but staying on this, you mentioned earlier, um, with the pandemic, I mean, we can't really work in museums right now. Um, and you said you've been working on, um, on panels. So I'm just wondering more generally how the um, pandemic has changed both of your, maybe your professional work as a museum professional, but also your artistic practice. Yeah, I think the pandemic kind of changed us all. Well, I hope it does yeah. in a way that, you know, people get really careless, you know, and um, I think just that quietness was a blessing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we would sit outside and it was just quiet. You didn't hear no cars on the freeway, on the road. You didn't see any airplanes flying in the sky. You didn't even see any jet streams. The sky was totally blue. Um, it was it was quiet. You know, we hear laughter of our family, of my grandkids, and there was conversation again. There was talking to one another. There was working with the land. Everybody was building gardens. I mean, in some ways, it was a a, a blessing in disguise, mm -hmm. and you know, yet it was. It was very harmful to a lot of people. You know, it kept us hovering, hovering for an amount of time that we had to become very creative with our time and what we needed to do. So, uh, you know, Indian market was shut down. That was a majority of us artists from the area has been our, our income for many years. Mm -hmm. And I'm praying that it's gonna happen this year this summer um and yeah it, it put a damper on my sales market was not happening I know virtual um market um I didn't really participate in that to the full extent because I I guess I'm just kind of old school and I I can't uh I really like seeing people and talking and seeing reactions to my work because People always say, is it on leather? Is that clay? You know, they have all these curiosity um, input to add to my, you know, to my dialogue that I share. So, um, you know, yeah, it was tough um, financially, but I think it gave you a lot of time to think about um, more layers to add and, um, and layers that, involved the family and layers that involved 
um, stories because you're home. And my mom, I love visiting my mom. She's full of stories and um, gave, gave some really cool times to, uh, to sketch ideas and think of the next step, like what direction I want to go in. Do I want to still keep what I'm doing or what I want to do next? I did a lot of research on, you know, websites. I was um, doing research for the De Young Museum in San Francisco. Uh, finished that. That was nice. Kind of cut short because of the pandemic. Um, right now I'm doing research for the state of New Mexico for the inner tribe, uh, the intertribal um, Gallup intertribal ceremonials. So I'm doing artifact research for them now. So, you know, those are things that you can do virtually. So it's not so bad, but right now, um, you know, it's, it's moving to different directions. So I like that. I do a lot of contract work. So, you know, and my, um, my experience with researching as a appraisal assistant has also gave me a lot of experience. So researching and looking at old artifacts is what sparks my interest to add into my new work. So, you know, I like weaving, weaving the willows. So I'm working also on a, my new willow woman she was sitting behind me, but I had to move her. She looked a little too strange sitting there. <laughs> but uh, I, um, I'm doing a new Willow Woman. So that's taking, I did a lot of walking um, and I still do. But, um, you know, I, I feel, like I said, the pandemic was financially difficult for many of us. But I think... Um, as artists, we, we become very clever with time and time is always um, what's needed to do our art. And I think it gave us a time to rethink our, our direction, rethink or refocus on our work. And hopefully we all develop something new in this and um, we'll create new work for the new coming years. Yeah, yeah, you know, a lot of people that I've talked to have really kind of made a similar point about being able to just kind of sit down and think about new ways of being generally in the world, but also um, refocusing on our, your work or your artistic practice. And I guess that kind of speaks to my last question, um, which is a big one, but where you see the future of Native art moving as a result of this past year. Well, I think just like any art, I think it's going to move. It constantly moves. It's an evolving world. It's an evolving time. It's That's what art is. Art is constantly evolving like we do. I mean, we got to grow. We got to keep mobile. We got to keep our mind don't stop. You know, our minds are always moving. So I think art is is constantly moving. I think Native American art is moving and it's shaking ground. I think it's shaking ground with not just the art movement, but also with um, what's happening in politics. I mean, look at Deb Holland. I mean, she's someone that is representing the native tribe and she's um, really um, giving us a lot of hope. And I think hope is what a lot of people need. And I think as artists and, and um, indigenous people in the art world, rather it's um, two dimensional art, filmmaking. I think we're gonna, we're, we're building up a lot of confidence in ourselves. And I think we're, we're gathering forces. And I think this, energy is going to explode and I think there's going to be art mediums art the new birth of our Native American art I think is basically going to happen mm -hmm. you know new genres are going to overlap older genres and new stories are going to get told 
And that's what should happen. That's exactly what should happen. I think our younger generation has seen a lot already. You know, my, my grandkids, I mean, to see my three-year-old wear a little mask on his face and not like it and, and not understand what's going on, you know? I mean, you can't help but think what's going on in his mind, you know? And, mm -hmm. and all the other kids that age, not just my grandchild, but the children that are coming behind us and the younger kids that, uh, you know, couldn't go back to school, my other grandkids, and they have to look at their teacher on their laptop, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, change is already happening. I mean, you know, rather it people like it or not, you know, I think it's how we utilize it and how we move forward. And I think a lot of this has to do with, you know, the status of our world and how, you know, how we got to keep moving. I mean, and, and look positive, look for positive things, have a positive attitude. And I think that'll bring us all um, a better future. Well, I think that's a good place to end, um, a very hopeful, positive place to end, um, unless there is anything that else that you'd like um, to talk about before we sign off. No, I think that's a good place to end too, being positive. And I think sending positive vibes to the world is, is the best way. And hopefully, I, I hope my art does that to people give them a positive energy. It absolutely does. Well, thank you, Deborah, so much for this lovely conversation. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk. Thank you. Have a great day.